We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and that was actually a really exciting entire Grand Prix weekend at CODA, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to give it like a 10 out of 10, but well, no. But we're back, and it was exciting. I hate to say it, and I just want to shoot myself in the foot when I do say this. I feel like the sprint was better than the Grand Prix. I I don't know if I would go that far, but the sprint was definitely really good. And like, I don't, I don't know. Do we do we like not hate sprints anymore? I don't know. I'm still undecided. I know. I feel, we'll we'll talk know, about I sprints think, in a minute, but I know we will. I know we will. But no, overall, it was a good weekend. Lots of you know shenanigans, having it being the U.S. Grand Prix, right? Big football weekend in Austin as well. You we saw all of the packages with all the sports things and the you know America things and making these poor foreign drivers try and guess our random random Americanness, um, which obviously will we'll never get old, but it is what it yeah. is. But no, I think it was a good weekend. But Coda always does a good weekend. Right. It, th- that's that's the thing about it is, is, yes, we just came back from a month off, but Kota always puts together something that ends up being exciting. And this in, in this situation, we had an actually good sprint race and also a race that had a lot of excitement toward the end, even if it wasn't necessarily an excitement at the front, because, you know, the Ferraris kind of just were off in their own little world. Yes, your I've Ferraris. never been happier to be very, very wrong. <laughs> we're like, oh my God, they're not bringing it's... upgrades. They're going to suck. Mur, mur, mur. Yeah. Turns out their oops. upgrades just weren't good for Singapore, but they worked for Kona. Fair. <laughs> yeah. But before we get into that, obviously we had so much news of the week going into our last episode because we spent yes. 40 of the 50 minutes covering all of the news that we missed over like there is no actual other news um other than the bib controversy which since the fia said it was in fact legal we're not going to talk about it but did you notice anything weird about the podium for, uh, oh, ceremony mean, like the incredibly awkward tire exchange for trophies yeah, so going into Kota, and I didn't, like, it, t- it took me a while, actually, to realize that there was something weird about that, because it's like, those trophies look weird, but I had forgotten that they announced that what the trophies were going to look like. They were designed by some Italian artist, and they kind of looked like, yep. you know, little, little bear robot thingies, and those were not the trophies that we saw. What we saw were pole position trophies and so apparently what had happened is the usgp and pirelli who designed the trophies they pulled them because they had put quote potential similarities with other designs and flew in backup trophies to austin from one of pirelli's offices that which is why we had the weird random trophy that Charles had. And then also the tire trophies for the constructors and P2 and P3. And my tinfoil hat is that Disney took one look at these trophies and sent a CND to Pirelli and to the USGP because they do look a lot like Mickey Mouse. And you know how Disney gets about copyrights and stuff when it comes to that. I don't know. So not going to lie, when I saw the trophies, I was like, oh, that looks familiar to something, but like, I don't know what... There is like a super big artist that has similar art. I don't know if it's like painting or sculpture. Um, and I don't know if it's the same artist who did all of these anyways, but I, it like registered in my mind of like, oh, these look familiar. I didn't pull Mickey Mouse and I didn't pull Disney, but like, it was like, oh, I've seen something like this before. Um, so I, I mean, I, I understand their, so it, their process for, there. 
in in my thought and and nobody has come out and attached disney to this let's let's point that out here first but i do feel like the trophy does look closely enough to mickey mouse that if disney noticed they would jump on it with like a cease and desist wise now the motorsport.com article that i took this from said that the this trophy's closely remembered sculptures by a brand called bear brick and they do look pretty similar and there's also an artist named brian donnelly or cause k-a-w-s that also has some some art sculptures that that look very similar to these trophies so any one of them could have said something but i think you know my first thought was disney but that's just my tinfoil hat moment right here oh no these look identical to bear brick yeah yeah and that's probably so, what i've seen it as or something because they have a whole thing with moma it's probably it but yeah, anyways. so it's probably Bear Brick, could be Disney, could be Cause. Um, either way, um, I just they think it's tires. funny. Like, they got tires instead. You know, I think Carlos got a medium tire and Max got a hard tire. And I think the soft <laughs> tire went to the Ferrari constructors, which considering it is soft tire is a red tire, red Ferrari, it actually kind of worked. It does. It does. Oh my gosh. I think that's, I mean, again, how many times do we have to say it on this podcast? Thousands of people have to okay these things, and somehow everyone okayed it up until the day that they actually had to be put into use. So exactly, I and will like, never understand. <laughs> There's no it's, control. I just think it's it's really funny how they like and they made like a big deal about this. There was supposed to be like little like little mini sculptures that you could buy, and like every bit has yeah. been taken down from the Prolly website. They're like, no, this never happened. Nope. Oops. No. 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 But, okay, so, and if you're wondering why they all got Pirelli tires, it is the United States Pirelli Grand Prix. Like, they are the title sponsor of the Grand Prix, which makes sense of why they right. got the random Pirelli tires. <laughs> and that's also like, Here, what... take a tire. <laughs> well, that's also what Pirelli had. Like, they, so they right. had to fly them in, like, last minute, because obviously we had the, the, the sprint trophies, which are those little metal placard things that they that they got after the sprint race so they had to fly these in like last second of like somebody probably got a call I don't know which Pirelli office it was but somebody was like go into the trophy cabinet and find four trophies that we can use fast and overnight them anyone have a spare tire leaning around the paddock with the <laughs> Yeah, here I we mean, go. <laughs> I honestly was like, "Oh, do they like just have a bunch of random tire trophies that they just bring with them to every race, just in case?" Maybe, but I don't know. So I, I just think it's all that it was all just really funny. Uh, well, you know, it's never a dull moment in F one. Really, um, no. So I do want to address the elephant in the room of this weekend being a sprint weekend. So. Right. If you've been a long time listener of the podcast, you know how adamantly Catherine and we I do not like sprints. Sprints, and if you want to know why, listen to our Qatar um, episode from last season. Link yep. to both. Um, <laughs> so I feel like I need to start walking this back, especially because I know that we're going to have Brazil in a few weeks, and Brazil is such a good. Sprint it's going to be weekend. really good, and it's also just made for sprints, but. This was actually a good sprint. It was actually entertaining. There was just so much going on. I think the format's better this year than last year, which is why I like it a little bit more. I appreciate yeah. and I really like how they can have like the sprint and then keep working on the car and it doesn't go into Park Ferme like Friday morning because I right. think that's dumb. But yeah, I don't I don't hate it. It was actually super exciting. And also yeah. like it was the start to Ferrari's great weekend. That's true. Yeah, I don't I don't necessarily think that you have to walk back hating sprints because I think that we, you know, have had a a, a lot of very good reasons to strongly dislike the sprints since you and I started watching Formula 1 because the yeah. formats have not been good and the overall it has not been conducive to good racing, but the way that they've, you know, adjusted the format for this season of having a sprint shootout followed by the sprint and then qualifying to, to proceed the Grand Prix, it works a lot better. And like you said, having that park ferme in between the sprint and Grand Prix qualifying means that we don't have what we had happen last year at Cota, which led to Lewis Hamilton and Charles Leclerc being disqualified. Yep, exactly. And I think... F the like 
whoever sets the schedule, FIA, F1, whoever they are. I think they're kind of finding their their stride with sprints of like where we sprint. Like coda has been yes. a sprint for a very long time. Brazil is a sprint again. I think they're kind of like, okay, these work. So we're going to keep these. And then let's test out all of these other ones to see if they make good sprints. And honestly, personally, I am fine with the same like seven or eight races every year being a sprint and like just knowing going into it, it's going to be a sprint if it's going to be a good product. Like I, right. I don't want to have eight sprints on uh, circuits and tracks that like make no sense to be a sprint. Now I am hopeful that they will keep this, you know, merry-go-round going and we get Monaco as a sprint because I think yes. Monaco would be a great sprint race. So maybe they do it and they're like, oh, everyone had their doubts. But you know what? This one girl, Emily, was really adamant about it. And she was right. And this was perfect. So I think that I think personally, it makes more sense for them to be like, okay, these are our sprint weekends forever until they leave the calendar. I think I just I personally would rather see that in a good product than like a bullshit sprint. I, I don't disagree. Like, you know, China was a good sprint race. I don't think Miami is a good sprint no. race at all. No. I think that Miami, the the way that the track is configured, that back straight is too long to, to be conducive Correct. to a good sprint race. Cota works as a sprint. Brazil, as we said, works really well as a sprint. So yeah, so let's find tracks that are good at being sprint races and, you know, look at the, the shorter tracks that are going to be more exciting i think that you know china might be one of the longer tracks but it's still configured but well china, for the sprint. i was fine with and like right Austria and it was a great too. race the the red bull ring is perfect for sprint. sprint it's yeah. perfect for a sprint exactly it's the ones that are shorter with not super long straights like i i want i want just a set sprint schedule i feel like that's not that hard to ask i mean if Stefano Domenicali gets what he wants and we're going to have 24 sprint weekends in a 24 weekend calendar, but to come but that I mean, means that Monaco will be a is sprint. Is a sprint. <laughs> yes. So yes, Mon- Monaco still needs to be a sprint race, but yeah, this was, this was a good sprint race. Like we, you know, it, we had, you know, some really great overtakes max as a red, as the Red Bull fan wearing the, the Williams gear, max did win. He's still, still winning sprint races. Carlos kind of came out of nowhere and came in for that P2. We had a double points finish for Haas that has allowed them to leap over um, V carb in the constructors championship they were even on points going into the grand prix and now are up two points after the grand prix weekend so there were there was a lot that happened it was exciting racing it was it was good and i'm not saying that we should eat our words about sprints but the way that sprints have evolved makes them more platable i just want to clarify do you mean v carb or alpha towery <laughs> that's a great question and to go off track a little bit, the the going back and forth between Fernando Alonso calling Liam Lawson in the V-Carb and Alpha Tauri and the V-Carb social media admin putting that post of a V-Carb driver and a racing, a racing point, point driver, driver having a conversation, which if you have watched our F1 genealogy series, you'll know that racing point preceded Aston Martin. So that little T going back and forth. And they also made a dig at Alpine for driving a car that looked just like a McLaren. So so F1 social media, as always, was on it this weekend, and that was that one quite was entertaining. so good. It's like, oh, so nice of the McLaren to lend you a car this weekend. <laughs> yeah, and like to be fair to Fernando, not to like be in the like aging Fernando Alonso category that we always do, but it's kind of similar to how Ted Kravitz always calls Sauber Sauber, and Martin Brundle calls Mercedes Mercedes Benz. Like it's. You sometimes you just default to a name and V Carb is kind of a more ridiculous name than Alpha Tauri. So I can I can see why Fernando just off the cuff throughout the the last year team brand. Oh yeah, no, for sure. For sure. I was also convinced that Fernando and Liam were gonna take each other out during the race. Just oh, based yeah. on how they were going back and forth all weekend. Like they 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 are they, like that is gonna be the new rivalry on the grid is Fernando Alonso and Liam Lawson. And I'm here for it. It's hilarious. Maybe, but like, I just don't see, like, I just can't be team Liam. I just can't. I mean, you don't have to be. I am a diehard Danny Rick fan and I refuse to support 
the usurper. <laughs> I mean, we'll talk we'll talk about Liam a little bit more in Liam's performance this weekend in a little bit, but I, I have some thoughts too. But before we get there, let's talk about your Ferraris. Let's talk about my boys in red. So Charles literally out of nowhere, like never on my bingo card, I would Not I even ever close. say that he was going to even be on the podium. Like, yeah, he qualified in the second row and so did Carlos, but it's like, oh, well, it's only going to take him like five seconds to mess this up. Right. Um, but he had a, per- I would argue, perfect first corner. Perfect oh, first yeah. corner. And Carlos, if Carlos like just went, like didn't break, if he waited on breaking like a little bit longer, I feel like he would have taken P2, but I think he probably broke, hit his brakes at the appropriate time. If he would have let it go a little bit longer, he would have crashed, which obviously no one wants. Right. Um, but he was so close in there and then, you know, just really hit it into high gear. And I am so, so happy for Ferrari. I do love an opportunity to hear the Italian national anthem on the podium because oh, not I only don't like hearing it, I like just hearing them chant it and I, yell it. Yes, that's exactly. What I love. That's oh, that is the best part it gives me of it. Chills. Yeah. yeah. Also, so the the Italian national anthem along with the Monaco national anthem are two very long <laughs> anthems back to back. Like yeah. sometimes it's really funny that you're like, okay, so when is this anthem gonna be over? Like it's taking like. At least when you have, like, Lando winning at McLaren or Lewis and George winning at Mercedes, like, it's just one anthem because it's British driver, British team. But then you have, like, Monagas driver, Italian team, and it's, like, 20-minute long anthems, which I yeah. think is funny. But I do love the Italian national anthem. I do, too. It's it's always entertaining to watch. But yeah. But yeah and also, so- to, to speak about Carlos, the strategy that they had, because he had a pretty tough first stint, but the strategy was shockingly good that allowed him to overtake Matt through the pit lane. Um, okay. Yeah. Yes. When they originally started to do the undercut, I was like, um, concern. Huh, Ferrari's going to try an undercut. What are we doing? Um, and I was, DMing my other friend too, and we're both like, "Oh my god, they're gonna undercut Max! This isn't gonna work. <laughs> what is Ferrari doing?" But it actually worked, surprisingly. Right. So yeah, no, I think I think they're coming back. They're gonna make a push for constructors. Yeah, and we'll talk about that in a second. But I also want to point out that the last time we had a Ferrari 1-2 in the United States was in 2006 in Indianapolis, which was the last time we had a race in the United States prior to bringing Coda onto the calendar because 2006 is a year after the 2005 disaster of a United States Grand Prix that kind of ruined Formula One in the United States for a little while, which we also have a full episode about. I'm sure linked do. above. We sure do. And then rounding off the podium, we have Max, who I, when Max doesn't win, I just don't see him on the podium for some reason. Interesting. I don't know why, but it's like he either wins or he's not on the podium. And that's just like in my mind. I know that's not true, but that's just like how my brain processes it. So seeing him on the podium in P3 was like, oh yeah, like Max is there. Mm -hmm. Um... And it should have been Lando. It really should have. I'm very, very annoyed with McLaren's, like, engineering team or whoever gave the race direction that he should not give up the place. Because if he just gave up the place and then overtook Max at the end, like, then he would have been P3 because he clearly had the pace to, to overtake him. And them saying, like, oh, no, it's our position. Like, you were ahead at the apex. It's ours. It's ours. It's ours. It's like... You are risking a five-second penalty that will then drop you from the podium. Like, give it back to him really quick and then retake it. Because they were still, at the time, I think they were, like, four laps left or something. So like, Yeah, clearly, there was enough time. Exactly. There was definitely enough time. Um, it, it's just, it's really a pity to see because Lando did drive a pretty good race considering how horrible he started. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I'm just a little frustrated with McLaren. Yeah, I... Even as the the Red Bull fan of the podcast, he was very happy when Lando got that penalty. But 
they really, sh- like there, as you said, there was plenty of time for him to overtake. The McLaren had the pace. Max can only do so much to defend Lando in that car with, you know, yes, there were upgrades to the Red Bull that clearly helped, but they're not perfect, which we knew that they weren't bringing all of the upgrades to Coda because they noticed that there was going to be some issues and we didn't want to have what we've been having since what, Imola or even before, you know, Spain, yeah. whatever. So, so you know, McLaren is, and and they keep doing this thing where they, they just like shoot themselves in the foot a little bit of, they have moments where they really could be on par with Red Bull from a like flawless strategic performance standpoint, but then they're like, mm, no. And whether or not Lando would have wanted to give the place back, all it takes is for his race engineer to say, you can overtake him again in a heartbeat. Let's not risk the penalty because the penalty also easily could have been 10 seconds instead of five, which would have put him right. behind Oscar, which would have made it worse. I mean, he picked up 18 points this weekend. Max picked up 23. So it, what, you know, he needs as, as many points as he can get for the, for the driver's championship fight, let alone the constructor's championship, which is also still wide open. And then my last point about this is <laughs> I just want to, I, I want to get this out. And I was talking to my dad about this um, when I was driving to pick up my dinner that there's, the other reason why they should have directed Lando to give up the place and, and overtake him again is the is race control and the stewards had given out this exact same penalty to multiple drivers all race long in this exact same situation. So of course they're also as you know staying co- as consistent as they were today. They were also going to give that one to Lando. It was kind of a no brainer that they would have given him that penalty. And why would you risk that? And it's not like this was out of you know out of the norm for how the the race directors and the stewards were you know adjudicating these you know these moments on track. Like th- this is how they had been very consistent all race long. So yes, Lando was going to get the penalty too. And I, Max was I still think ahead. The, I think the only argument there is that McLaren truly did believe that he was ahead of the apex. And like all the other all the other penalties that they had doled out, like clearly they weren't ahead. Like clearly right. it was very, very clear. I I would say that of the penalties that were given out today, this was the closest one for it to be like a non fact a non like that it would go to no, to Max instead of Lando. Right, or that, yeah, exactly. Or, like, it would just be, like, oh, they were racing, whatever. So yeah. I think, like, yes, you can use the precedent set by the other ones, but I think this was much, much closer than the others. No, no, it was definitely very close, and obviously the other, you know, thing in McLaren's back pocket that they would argue is, you know, what about lap one? But they also look at lap one, turn one. They look at those incidents in the the way drivers drive very differently from how they're going to look at something on like lap 40 or 50. So I'm, I can live with the fact that Max did not get a penalty for pushing Lando off and Lando did get a penalty for pushing Max off, you know, in a different portion of the race, just because of how formula one has been, you know, it has its issues. But I don't count lap one corner one. Like I I agree. I don't count that one either. Yeah. Unless like there's a clear hit, like right. Alex Albon hit Ocon or whatever, but right. Exactly. And yeah, for that. it's yeah. But I think that's a whole, whole nother can of worms. Um, I wanted to talk about one thing and now I can't remember what I wanted to talk about. Maybe I'll think of it later. Yeah. In other news, Bern Mylander finally made an appearance while actually driving the safety car this weekend for the first time since Canada. So that's very exciting. We we haven't exactly missed him, but it has been a very long time since we've seen him. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a hot minute since we've had a safety car. And honestly, I wouldn't have thought this would be a race where we would have a, safe, a safety car. I mean, I thought it would have been, like, I thought they were just going to throw out the virtual safety car and wait for them to clear Lewis's car from, from when he crashed. But the, apparently it was enough to, to call the, the regular safety car and bring by my lander. I don't know, up. like, what the line is for virtual versus real safety car. And, like, I know that there's probably some arbitrary, like, super vague language that leaves it up to judgment. Classic. But, like, it really screwed Ferrari. <laughs> I would just like to say, yeah, because 
like early on in the race. Obviously, they ended up one two, so it's fine. But like Carlos was in a really good spot to get DRS and start overtaking and whatever. But it's fine. I digress. I just I don't think it was bad enough for a real one, and that's why I'm always curious on like who makes that final call and like what's that actual line. Yeah. I know when people well, like actually have to go out. It's normally it's a, a it's real definitely. Car, but. It's definitely subjective. It's based on like where the car crashes. How is how easy is it for for them to clear? How you know w- while also keeping it safe for the marshals. There's also and we saw this when George crashed in qualifying. Like yeah. depending on how hard the crash is, the medical car will immediately come out. And George's crash was like 25 G's or something absurd. Yeah, so the medical it, it car immediately deployed. G's, so they had um, to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So and also speaking of who impressed, and I know that he's not your favorite, but George. George did drive from the pit lane to P6 on a one stop and managed to hold off, you know, Sergio Perez. And obviously Russell had, not, I, I know, I know. That's not but, a feather in the cap. <laughs> but they, but they did, they did actually fight a little bit and he did hold, hold them off because they were, they were overtaking each other late that we really didn't see, but I noticed on the data channel, um, which is why I have the data channel up when I'm watching races, but even though the fact that George had, you know, a bunch of different, you know, brand new elements in his car, which is why he started from the pit lane and also, right. you know, crash, it was still a, a really good race from, from George. Much better than his teammates. Well, yeah, that's, that was not great, but I mean, it is what it is. Right. Um, I also, again, going back to my previous statement of not supporting the usurper, but Lawson, <laughs> I guess I can go without saying he did have, you know, a good race, I guess. He started with a 60 place grid penalty. So he started in P19 because George was from the pit lane. Yeah. He had nowhere further to go. Um, but he basically started in Mexico City. <laughs> basically. He's there a week early. Um, I, I'm really interested to see how this partnership works between him and Yuki. Um, I feel like, I personally feel like, Yuki has habitually been treated like the, you know, ugly stepchild of the family, and he is always given second best, and, like, we saw that a little bit when Danny came on, Pierre was favored, I feel like they're going to well, do the same thing Well, I think Gasly was rightfully favored right. at the time. That's fair, but, like, yeah, I, and I think the same thing's going to happen here with Lawson, too, of, like, he's always going to be treated as the number one driver, and Yuki's just Yuki. That's just my personal opinion. I, I know. I, I don't think you're wrong, but it it actually, it kind of, first, first of all, I want to say that Liam Lawson is not here to make friends, and so the bromance that Yuki had with Pierre, and even the friendship, and the good, you know, relationship that he had with Danny, we're not going to see that from Liam Lawson, because Liam Lawson is, is, throwing down the gauntlet for Sergio Perez's seat and you know he'll he'll play the team game and he'll 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 you know do what he needs to do obviously he tried to help Yuki in in qualifying on Saturday with you know trying to give him the toe because there was no point in him trying to stay in qualifying with a 60 place grid penalty but I think that Lawson is here and, you know, he was overlooked by Danny after Nick DeVries left. And I think that different from Nick DeVries, who came on saying, I'm going to be the number one driver at AlphaTauri, Liam Lawson is coming on and saying, I'm not going to say it, but I'm going to show you that I'm the number one driver at at VCARP. I don't know. He gives like major Nick DeVries energy of like, I have a seat now and I'm going to be on Red Bull next year. And <laughs> And I think they're just going to wish that they still had Checo because Checo, I, like they, he, Checo is a puppet and they can make him do anything. And I think Liam Lawson is just like, I don't know. I have this weird feeling that I don't like him. So I, I don't have any like, you know, inherent biases like I do towards say Lewis, but I, I do think that he is making the play that Nick DeVries wanted to make when he came on and, but Lawson came on with a statement of moving toward the, you know, up the field in a car. That's not great. And also took advantage of the fact that yes, Danny got canned, but Yuki has not driven well since, you know, before the summer break. So, you know, he's, he's making, it very clear that Yuki has been struggling for a while and Yuki's got to figure something out. Yeah, I, but, and I, I don't just feel this way about 
Lawson and Yuki. I kind of feel this way about Franco Colapinto and Albon as well. Like when you get someone fresh into this seat who's really trying to prove themselves, I think you're going to get a different product than someone who has a seat. You know what I mean? That's that's fair. So, the like, the Nick DeVries like that a, we saw subbing for right, Albon was very different from... So right. that, that's like, totally fair. And Franco right now is driving for his life to get a stake seat or just like some sort of form of recognition. And Lawson is still driving to potentially secure a seat and Yuki has a seat. So it's like, I think it's a little different. Yuki's settled into like, okay, this car is shit. We know it's not very good. Like I'm going to do whatever I can. And Lawson's like, I'm going to drive this car into the ground because I need something. And same with Franco. So I think it's just new blood, new life in the car. I don't want to call it like newcomer luck because nothing in F1 is luck. It's a lot of skill, but I think it's just a very different situation than, than Yuki. And I don't think it's fair to compare like Lawson to Yuki. No, like, it's yes, not they're in the same car, but like just situationally, I think it's a very, very different situation and they're that, going about it differently. That's true. But I think it still highlights the fact that Yuki has not like at the very least, Danny was driving well after the summer break, like those two races and Yuki hadn't been at all like there you know that it was it was a lot of like right, giving but people he had hope. already been in, he had already been announced that he has a seat and he's kind of like giving up on the car because the car sucks and that's so not like, a good I mean, thing to do and like that's well, no, that's not going to endear but... him any more to helmet marco to get into a red bull seat if he's throwing in the towel it we V-car. all know he's going to aston martin he's well, giving up all... his red bull dream. but also yes. like imagine uh, also think this like yuki's been driving for this team forever he's never been up for a red bull seat and it's bs if they ever say that he'll be in the red bull seat because we know he won't right so it's like imagine being passed over continuously like i don't know i give yuki a pass and not just because he's yuki but because of like what he's been able to do in that seat for how long he's been in that seat and just continuously have a revolving door of people going to red bull you know what i mean that's fair but i'm also team what are you doing for me now and he has not done much for v carb lately that's fine that's but anyway, also to Franco, um, obviously he is driving for that stake seat. Um, it's, you know, it's probably going to be Botas. It might, should be Franco. I think if it's not Franco, it'd probably be complicated by the fact that Williams would only want him to like go there on loan. And so like contract wise, it might not be possible for him to go to stake, but Franco does need to be, you know, he, he has proven that he could be a, a very capable formula one driver in a Williams or in a different car. And well, I think we'll see him back at some point, even if it I may not be, be in 2025. I know he'll be in, like, Young Drivers program for sure next year, like, doing, um... I mean, he'll be their reserve driver. Yeah. I I personally would love to see Carlos and Franco at Williams when Alex Albon's contract is up. Um, that could nothing be against Alex Albon, but I just, I'm not seeing a ton from him of, like, leading the team. And I think next year having Carlos take a seat and Carlos just being Carlos... I think it's going to really hurt Alex and potentially discourage him and he won't be able to handle the pressure. I mean, just look at what happened when he went to Red Bull, right? Like driving with Max, he's like, that's really hard. Max isn't Carlos and Carlos isn't Max, but still driving for like an obvious, driving behind like an obvious number one driver. I think that'll be hard on Alex just seeing his history with it at Red Bull. Yeah, and I mean, to to be fair, he also kind of got screwed a little bit because, you know, he was driving well enough in the Red Bull, but Perez was available. And, you know, if if, if you were comparing yeah. Alex Albon and Sergio Perez at the time, then it was really a no-brainer for, for Red Bull to be like, sorry, Alex, we're going to keep you in the stable, but it's Sergio Perez. Look at the, you know, he, he won that race from P20, um, in, 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 uh, in Sakir. So we got to call this guy up. Yeah, that's fair. And look but. at where Checo is now. And we're just counting down the minutes until Red Bull wakes up and says that they need to make a change. <laughs> Some people aren't even counting down the minutes. They are already dead set on him not having a seat, AKA everyone at Sky Sports. Um, yeah. That was pretty aggressive. Again, I love British commentary because they're just like no holds bar. Right. You know, shoot from the hip. And they're all so adamant that Checo won't have a seat next year. And I don't think they're wrong. I mean, 
It took Checo so long to pass Franco today. Like, it was so ridiculous. Franco wasn't even racing him because he's like, this isn't who I'm racing. This isn't right. my competition. I'm in a Williams. That's a Red Bull. He was literally just driving, and it took Checo forever to pass him. Like, that's yeah. – it's just unacceptable, honestly, at yeah, this point. Like, I don't been- know what he's doing. He spent way too much time stuck behind cars that a Red Bull has no business being stuck behind. The Williams, Kevin Magnuson's Haas, Yuki's um, V-Carb. Like, none of these cars are cars that he should have been behind for and should have struggled to overtake. But he has shown that he has struggled to overtake many cars, including Yuki. And obviously, Yuki is, you know, like, I got to show Helmet that I'm, you know, worthy of at least being considered for the Red Bull seat that he's not being considered for, no matter what anyone says. Yeah, it's a it's a rough life over there, but yeah, I don't know. Um, and we kind of highlighted it earlier. Someone else who's just struggling is Lewis. Lewis just didn't have a good weekend, but I mean, Bad. he DNF. I don't necessarily say that that's like the worst. Well, because it was a car world. issue. It wasn't a, like he right. had like like he like he spun because there was something wrong with the car, not because right. dinner time for Bishop, not because. Like, he had a brain fart because he's, you know, been driving in Formula 1 exactly. for 800 years. Like, it was yeah. a really bad weekend. And, like, the the only thing that I would ding him with is, like, he could not qualify a Mercedes out of the bottom five. Like, that's... Yeah, but I think he was just having issues with the car all weekend. Yeah. Like, it just, it just was not working for him. So... I don't know. Yeah, and and honestly, I mean, it, like, it had to be something with the upgrades because he had the upgrades and George didn't. And he yeah. offered George his upgrades after he blew that qualifying and they like they weren't going to do that. But yeah, he it, it was it was probably something with the upgrades that just didn't gel with the car with him in the car. Right. And like if, if you're if your upgrades are actually downgrades, like there's only so much you can do. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. But still, I don't think that Mercedes should have been at that bottom five. I don't know. You never know. You never know. Okay, so let's get to the constructors update, because this is like what I'm most excited about, considering that uh, Ferrari just racked up points this weekend. Yeah. So between P1 and P3, there are 48 points, which is absolutely insane. Right. Um, If you... We, if we were looking this time last year, I'm pretty sure there were like 200 points and they'd already clinched by this time. Um, they'd be Red Bull, but this year it's much, much different. Kathy and I were just talking about before recording that like the competitiveness of this season is off the charts and it's exactly what we're looking for in F1. Like this is super exciting. And I just, I have to thank Max because Max and Red Bull pushed everyone else to do better. And right. this is what we get. So we get such a good product, but like I said, 48 points between P1 and P3. So it's McLaren, Red Bull, Ferrari. So McLaren has 50, 544 points. And then 40 points behind them is Red Bull with 504. And then eight points behind them is Ferrari with 496. So. So close. So close. And considering the fact that Red Bull only has one driver because Checo just refuses to assist and get points, I believe that next weekend Ferrari will jump Red Bull. Yeah, I th- I think that it, especially if they pull out another another one of these performances, then yes. And then to put this into driver's championship considerations, any points that Ferrari drivers can take away from Lando is points that are basically still going to Max. So I'm I'm not mad about it. Yeah. I mean, I think the Ferrari drivers at this point are really driving for the team, not themselves, just considering that, like, Charles would have to win every single race and, like, everyone else would have to DNF, and then he could possibly win, but they're both pretty much out of contention. It's really down to Lando and Checo. Max, not Checo. Not Checo. Lando and Max. So I am all for this whole like team camaraderie over at Ferrari. They seem to like actually (laughs) be racing well. I think I also kind of would love a push for them to win this year as like a farewell to Carlos, but we'll see. That could, yeah, that could be fun. I I could could be down for that today. I'm going to be honest. No, he did it. Oscar did look great. And the Ferraris looked good all weekend. So I don't know. We'll yeah, and even you know, Lando was Lando did not have a great sprint, but 
you know, it, it could be, it could be very interesting. Also, I thought it was really funny. Like as soon as Lewis crashed and, and was, and was out of the race, motorsport.com posted on Instagram, Lewis Hamilton is officially out of championship contention. <laughs> like they were on it. So mathematically, everybody in the uh, driver standings from Lewis and above can still technically get there. But we all know that it is basically between Max and Lando. And I think Max has, I think there's like 57 points between Max and Lando right now. 56 or 57. Yeah, something something like like that. that. So so Max was able to kind of he was able to increase his lead this weekend, which is actually something that he hasn't really been doing lately. It had been a lot of like, Max or Lando chipping away. So for from Max's side, he you know he was successful in that he was able to get some points on Lando. Yeah. Um, before we move on to our predictions, I just want to throw this funny out there. So um, beginning of the season, we all knew that some teams were going to struggle. We had high hopes that Alpine. This is the first time I think we're mentioning Alpine this week. Um, they looked like a McLaren, so it was very hard to to see so true. You know, That's what why. they actually look like. Yep. But we thought that Alpine would probably go scoreless. Unfortunately, they have score points. Um, but Stake is still scoreless. So mm-hmm. Stake drivers, Joe Guanyu and Valtteri Botas um, have not scored a point. And Botas is currently sitting in P23 of a 20 driver championship. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so if you're wondering how that works, let us explain. So Ollie Behrman is up there because he's oh yeah, so, where where is he? The, the, I, wanted, I, have, I haven't combined? looked lately. Are yeah, all the, his points combined, or is it like is he on there twice? <laughs> he no, his his individual points are combined, but his you know one t uh, Ferrari gets the six that he got, and and Haas gets the the other one. Um, Ollie Behrman is currently 17th in the championship with seven points. He's ahead of Franco Colapinto, Esteban Ocon, Liam Lawson, Joe Guanyu, Logan Sargent, and Valtteri Bottas. Yeah, so we'll have we have multiple drivers for multiple teams. So like Danny's on there, now Liam Lawson's on there, Logan Sargent was on there, now it's Colapinto. Um and Ollie Behrman, of course, drove for Ferrari and Haas. So that, you know, will add up to your 23 drivers in the 20 driver championship so. and then if you're wondering how they split up the 21 22 23 between guan uh joe guan Yu, logan Sargent, and valtteri botas who all have zero points <laughs> well it's also all based on their best finishes in the, the like their aggregate best finish so joe guan Yu has had a better grid place finish than botas has and same with Sargent. like botas is like best finish this season is not that good hold on i, I will i will We'll pull it up to to escape. I know he's not that good, but I feel like Joe Guan Yu either DNFs or gets P twenty. Like I don't understand how he's ahead because there were moments where he slightly sucked. Oh, he China. had a he had, no, China. no no he ret- uh, no he he was finished he p- finished P fourteen in China. He finished P eleven in Bahrain, which was his best finish this year. Whereas Sargent's best finish was also P11, but with fewer races raced. And Botas's best finish has been P13. Wow. Yeah. So that is why it is Joe Guan Yu, Logan Sargent, Valtteri Botas. The more you know. The fun facts. Random little the bits of Formula facts. One you never thought you'd know. All right. Let's jump into our code of predictions. You did good this weekend. Free. Uh, well, I got two points, but yes. So I successfully picked polls for the sprint and you know what? We should do this going forward or next, not going forward. Cause we can't asterisk this, but next season, if you manage to get like on sprint weekends, if you get like both polls or like both podiums or P8 and P10, we should get like a bonus. Ooh, maybe we will discuss that in the off season. Um, anyway, so for the sprint race, let's start there. So sprint pole getter was Max. You had Oscar. I had Max, so I got a point there. Sprint podium, which we did not have on our radar, was Max Carlos Lando, which I that's like our OG podium, right? <laughs> switching like Lando and Carlos. So I'm honestly surprised that we've moved away from it. But we both had Oscar Max Lando, and Oscar did not do well. Nope. Um, and then for sprint, P8 was Hulk. 
Um, Hulk actually had a really good weekend. <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> for their, like, pseudo home race. Um, yeah. But you had, we picked the Williams car. So you had Alex Albon. I had Franco Colapinto. Obviously, Oops. they didn't get P8. Um, and then for pole for the actual race today on Sunday, um, you had Oscar. I had Lando. So I got a point because Lando actually got full. And then for podium, Charles Carlos Max, which I would have put in a nope. hundred different podiums and that never would have been a podium. You had Max, Oscar, Lando. I had Lando, Oscar, Max. So whoopsies. Yep. And then P10 was our boy, Franco Colapinto. And I almost considered him, but then I was like, no, he's going to get like P8. Um, unfortunately, he did not. He got P10. You had Lawson and I had Hulk. So I was close. I was only off by one. Yep. Yep. Um, and honestly, Hulk did better than P10, so. Yeah. Didn't he? Um, I think he did. I thought, he's, I thought he got points in both races. I think that, I thought. No, that he, def- he definitely did, but I I wasn't really paying attention to the hot. He, yeah, he was P8. Yeah, he was P8. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. Cool, cool, yeah. cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, lovely. Okay. So, if you're keeping track like we are, Catherine has 28 points and I have 19 but it only takes one weekend, and honestly, we haven't been scoring points very often. So I could I could make a big comeback. All I need is one good weekend. My, my advantage still comes from the fact that I went perfect in Saudi Arabia. So, mm-hmm. you know, we who knows what will happen. We have five more race weekends to, you know, and we suddenly become psychic. Too. Extra points. Yeah. So. Or at least oh, become, okay. you know, precognitive. Yeah. Uh, well, as always, Coda puts on such a great show. We have to go next year. It's literally in my backyard. Yeah. It's not. It's like four hours away, but still, it's close enough. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Everything's bigger I... in Texas. Your backyard is bigger. But also, next year, we won't have the Georgia Texas football game the same day as the sprint day. So, one, one you, less giant non- nonsense. You would absolutely have to kill me. But. Love the transition, Catherine, because that brings us to my off-track moment, yeah. which is, I don't know how many videos I sat and watched and was just, like, laughing but also cringing on the inside. So, like I said at the very beginning of the podcast, like, for some reason, the U.S. Grand Prix in Austin at CODA, it's just, like, this is America. Let's throw all of our America stuff at every single driver. So it's like, what college mascot is this? And it's like the Stanford Cardinal. And it's like, no one's going to know that. And then it's like the Gamecocks. It's like, oh, yes, of course, because they're going to know who that is. And then like NHL logos. It's like, you guys, come on. Well, I think they're going to be closer to like figuring out an NHL hockey team than they would be like a college mascot because college athletics is so wild. Like college and sports is so so wildly different internationally. Like internationally, they like when when we saw like half the grid at the football game, they were like all guests from from UT. Like they look how so they look so because even Lance Stroll, who's Canadian, who knows what American football is and even has Canadian football, like he even looked confused. And like how many of them were told we were going to always looks confused. Yeah. But how many of them were told you're going to a football game and they were very confused when there was no soccer played in front of them. No, that's completely fair. Like it just looked really funny. The only person who looked to be enjoying themselves was like Jack Dewan. He looked yeah. like he was having a great time and like kind of like had a feel for it. Um, Kimmy Antonelli looked so uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, like he so looked confused. like a lost child. Like someone lost their leash child and he wound <laughs> up at. But also, you know, and I, I sent this to you. Um, it was that picture of Kimmy Antonelli and Jack Dewan. And I was like, Kimmy Antonelli looks like a toddler next to Jack He's Dewan. a child. He's like He's an actual child. child. It was just so funny. Also, my other final thought is I love how much they're like, the, especially like the Sky Sports commentators are, are obsessed with the American flag, which is just so ironic because they're British and we have a whole very long history of why we have an American flag that is related to the United Kingdom and England. So I just think it's it's hilarious whenever they're, they're talking about the American flag because obviously there's that giant one right off of turn one 
one on the track and they always like in like 13 stripes and 50 stars and blah and, and they just like they're obsessed with the american flag and it's so funny to me it's it's crofty's second favorite flag his first favorite flag is the Swiss flag because it's a square <laughs> and there's not many flags that are square shaped so that's pretty special that's a plus <laughs> Literally, I was listening to them talk about it, and I was just like, oh my god, this is, like, the most Sky Sports conversation ever. It's uh, but so no, they really British. Do. They point it out. And, like, but that's what we were saying in our prediction episode of, like, everyone's just, like, stars, stripes, eagles, ah, America. America. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, it is pretty funny. But, yeah, so that's my off-track moment for the weekend, just everyone trying to, like, make fools of all of these foreign, you know, drivers. And it's like, of course, yeah, the guy from, like, the Netherlands is going to know who, like, the, the Sabres are. are or the Gamecocks yeah. or whatever. The Oregon Duck one was really easy, obviously, because it said Oregon and, like, there's a duck. But Lando right. was still just, like, Oregon Duck? Duck? <laughs> um, so, yeah. And then someone asked if Bevo had someone inside him or if it was a real live animal. So I was like, <laughs> I missed that one. Good. Anyways, I thought it was hilarious. Um, if you haven't seen the hundred ep- or you know different reels on Instagram or TikTok, then I implore you to see it. But that is all we have for Coda. Up next, we are staying in North America. God bless. We have great race times again next weekend for Catherine yes. and I. So we have Mexico City Grand Prix, which is coming up this weekend. So we are hit back to back weeks after being off for this stupid fall break. Very excited to have back-to-back racing. Um, and we will have that prediction episode out for you guys on Thursday. I'm so excited for yeah. Mexico. I love this race. I mean, we've I we, we talk about it. Watch Checo make a fool of himself at his home race. Again. <laughs> yes. Let, let's okay. let's see if he can make it past lap right back one. To double DNF. <laughs> yeah. But also, like, you know, usually one of the the great standouts of, of that race weekend is his dad, who had a, like, mini heart attack a few races ago after Checo's crash. So we hope that he's doing well and that we hope that we get to see his presence there and that Checo, like, gets through the race weekend intact so that his dad is okay medically. Papa Perez. Yes, exactly. So look forward to our prediction episode coming out on Thursday for the Mexico City Grand Prix. But for right now, that's the podcast. Thanks for going off track with us, guys.